this is Dr. Hamid Elamyar, and I am the host of podcast with Dr. E. At this podcast, I sit with the world's experts in health, education, and community development to talk about current health challenges and ask them to share their experiences, knowledge, and thoughts with all nations across the world, especially the developing countries, so that we can learn from experts across the globe. My guest today is a world public health leader. It's an honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Samsek Trenharas. Thank you for your time, Dr. Trenharas, today. Oh, thank you, Dr. Hamid. Uh, nice to have me on your program. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Dr. Chen Harris is the president of National Health Foundation, a Thai NGO linking research to policy. Starting as practicing physician in rural Thailand to international health and health planning to deputy minister of health of Thailand. Initiating health economics capacity building in Thailand, founding director of Thai Health System Research Institute, team manager on research system reform study, extensive work with WHO, UNICEF, and other global organizations in health research. He is an expert research person of ministerial leadership program of Harvard Kennedy School and School of Public Health, invited to ministerial senior leadership fellow at HSPH or Harvard School of Public Health in 2017, where he spoke to the faculty and students at Harvard. Welcome to the show, Dr. Chin Harris. This pandemic has put the world in a standstill, not only health-wise, but also economically. The world le yeah. needs collaboration and exchanging of ideas and solutions in order to tackle crises like this coronavirus pandemic. These issue issues has huge implications for the future and leaders like yourself Dr. Jun Harris play a very important role in guiding the younger generations to become better leaders. Their audience. The goal of my podcast is to highlight the experiences of those confronting this pandemic and its socioeconomic implications to better understand what effective leadership is and how it can help control coronavirus. I strongly believe these discussions and insights of world's renowned leaders in public health should be shared broadly. And thank you all for joining us today. No factor is important to this pursuit of controlling the coronavirus than learning from outstanding leaders. So I really appreciate um, giving me the opportunity to um, have you on the show. Um, could you tell us about when you first started working as a physician in community ho uh, hospitals in rural Thailand? Oh, that was about 40 years ago. But before I told you that, I have to tell you that, you know, when I finished my high school, actually, I planned to be a scientist and a researcher, not, not a, not a so-called uh, practicing doctor. But because Thailand around uh, the year 1964 has started the so-called compulsory services for doctors, I, I was a, the seventh batch. That policy still continue up to today. So we have now about 50 years of continuous uh, compulsory services for medical graduates. Mm -hmm. So when I started uh, medical school, you know, things changed. And you might also know that in 1960, no, I'm sorry, 1973, Thailand has a very important change turning point in its political system mm -hmm. where the student uprising over through the military government. Uh -huh. I was an activist on that, not a leader, just joining. So, I mean, that, that more or less shaped the ways I look at the career of a doctor. Mm -hmm. So I started to pursue the career of a public health doctor rather than a scientist doctor. Although I was asked by the medical school to, you know, uh, take some scholarship and become a research doctor. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I started, you know, rural, rural Thailand is still quite uh, not that well developed compared to Thailand to today. Mm -hmm. The budget at the rural hospital was also very small. I started as a director of a small hospital. I mean, there are plenty of hospitals without directors <laughs> because mm -hmm. people went there and worked and then they left. So there are a number of so-called uh, small 
a hospital. So I, I chose one in the northeastern part of Thailand and started working there, mm-hmm. where I do I did many things. I I I saw patients. I have to oversee the management of the hospitals. I have to look at the financial status. A public hospital in Thailand were allowed to charge uh, patients uh, for fees collected for the so-called uh, further use by the by the hospitals. But it was also around the same time that the Thai government was very progressive. They introduced indigent policy, a card, indigent card policy, meaning they provide free medical services for any poor people who are coming for services at the public, hosp- uh, public hospitals. And Thailand has, has uh, started to invest more and more in rural hospitals at the district mm-hmm. level. Uh, so, I mean, this, I, I work at the district level. So this hospital become very, very uh, important. So we could do more for the people who came for services. Yeah. Uh, of course, we, we, we give free services to the poor and charge those who can afford to pay. And then gradually, you know, allow us to be able to provide uh, better services. But we also have to do public health program as well. We have lots of public health program at that time. You might have heard about the family planning program. Yes. It started around the same time as well. And Thailand has been seen as one of the successful countries in terms of implementing uh, family planning policy. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, after that, uh, we started the private health care uh, policy. But that's what when I, when, I, when I moved to the central ministry, I worked in the rural area for about uh, eight years. Mm-hmm. And meanwhile, you know, took my MPH course in uh, the Netherlands as well, because the Netherlands provided scholarship for Thai government to uh, you know, give to the public health uh, doctor mm-hmm. in the rural area to study public health there. We used to have lots of scholarship from the, from the U.S. Mm-hmm. Uh, to go to Tulane. But, you know, uh, starting in the mid-70s, early 80s, they don't, they don't give uh, such scholarship to the Thai student anymore from the U.S. So we only got the European ones. Well, hopefully that starts again uh, or restarts. <laughs> <laughs> well, well. Uh, that, that, that's a great, interesting story of uh, how you started and... Um... Uh, and and the fact that you wanted to be a scientist and then you switched back. Um, just to follow up the, with this question, uh, what would be your advice to younger physicians who are interested in public health and, um, you know, s- as someone who you started at the l- rural area? I would I would be I would be very glad to hear that you know medical students will be interested in public health because in Thailand it was such a such a rare breed. Mm-hmm. In other words, you know, most medical students look forward to becoming a specialist of some kind. Yeah. Uh, and right now, and I mean, at, the, at, 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 at present, if you are a medical graduate, there will be seats or, you know, spaces to become one, of, one, one kind of specialist or the others for almost all medical graduates. In other words, you know, you, you, can, you, can, you can become a specialist right away mm-hmm. uh, if you are not choosing your specialty. Yeah. But what happened is that... Uh, because of the compulsory services in Thailand, you know, we, we, we have the chance to go to, to, to work in the rural area. Mm-hmm. And there you do many things. I don't know other countries, mm-hmm. but I would say that if you are interested in public health, you know, it would be very good uh, to start working in one of the so-called, uh, I won't say underserved, but the, not the specialized centers. In yeah, other words, like you know, low, low resource areas. Yeah, don't become a specialist too quickly. Uh, to me, you know, becoming a public health person is something very re- rewarding. Mm-hmm. And as I say, you know, having been able to work in the rural area gave me a lot of insight and mm-hmm. understanding. Mm-hmm. In other words, you don't just become a pub- public health by just studying public health. Yeah. You became a public health, as a doctor, you became a public health uh, doctor because you work in the rural area. You work in the place where public health has the value. You can right. see that. Yeah. If you are a specialist, you work, you just see typical patients. Mm-hmm. You don't even know their background. You don't even know where they come from. You don't even know yeah. the, the situation that they are facing outside of hospitals. But mm-hmm. when you're in the rural area, you have the chance to do that. So if, if, you know, if in, 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 in your country you have that chance, I would advise you to, to start there. But then, of course, the other thing that I wish to, to, to say is that, you know, becoming public health, you also will gradually... Mm-hmm. You have to understand how you work with other people. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I, hope, I hope that you, you find working with other people you know, enjoyable and, 
and 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 easy for you because again, you know, many medical doctors mm-hmm. like to work only, you know, with very very few people. They are not good uh, team workers. So yes, uh, of course, uh, there's another thing that I that I that I wish to, uh, you know, see from the other side is that you don't just have medical students interested in public health. Mm-hmm. The medical school, or the so-called uh, doctors who are in the public health field, has to be the, the role model. They have to be also be looking looking for those who are interested, and then bring them in, talk to them, you know, let them see how things are. In other words, you know, I don't, I, I, I would, I would be very, very uh, uh, surprised if most medical doctors would, would want to become public health people. But on the other hand, as you say, there are those who are interested, but yeah. never had the chance to meet with the right person or yeah. had a good chance to really see for themselves whether they, how much they like it or how would they like to become a, yeah. a so-called public health doctor. <clears throat> yeah. And my own story about the, um, you know, how I decided to start public health after doing my residency in pediatrics is ah. a long story. I may, you know, just uh, have a, a podcast just for that. <laughs> <Some other time. laughs> well, well, maybe you could share it a little bit, you know, it would be yeah, yeah. to know um, how you came about. Well, gl- thank you so much. Um, for the, um, you know, just maybe in line with the question that I had, um, I would like to... Um, know that you started uh, your career as a physician and served as the um, Deputy Minister of Public Health of Thailand. That is a very mm-hmm. prestigious uh, and very, um, you know, huge responsibility at a country level. Mm-hmm. Uh, what made you decide to shift to health development and planning and global health as you first started as a physician? Mm. That's, uh, that's also another interesting uh, question, you know, Dr. Hamid. I, I, I recently read uh, an opportunity Mm-hmm. of a uh, well-respected public health expert, an American public health expert, uh, Dr. Jack Bryan. I don't know whether you heard about him, but he, he yeah. had come to Thailand oh, uh, yeah. in the 70s, mm-hmm. uh, working with uh, the medical school that I studied, Ramatipati Medical School. So I mm-hmm. got to, to know him. And he talked about, you know, uh, being asked, being asked by someone. And I, 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 I think, you know, you might have the same the same uh, kind of uh, journey in your, in your career. I was asked by my boss. Mm-hmm. Uh, let, me, let me backtrack a little bit. When I started working in the rural area, I never thought that I'll, I'll, come, I'll come back to Bangkok. I grew up and I was uh, raised in Bangkok. I grew mm-hmm. up as a city boy. <laughs> mm-hmm. But when I started working in the rural area, I found that the, the life there is quite uh, pleasant. Yeah. Uh, and I should I should add that because the Thai government has also invested a lot mm-hmm. in the in the health system, you know, during the seventies uh, yeah. onwards. Yeah. But anyway, back back to back to uh, how I became interested in public health and uh, and in planning and health development. Uh, my boss, who at that time was a provincial chief medical officer, but he is also a very uh, hardworking and very uh, dedicated uh, leader. So he was asked to uh, leave the provincial chief medical office post to come to the central ministry to serve as a so-called chief medical officer in the Ministry of Public Health. So he asked me to, to come along with him. And it happened that at that time, the Ministry of Health has agreed with the World Health Organization that we will have the national uh, program officer. So I was asked because I, I, my, my English is not too bad. Mm-hmm. So I was asked to, uh, <laughs> to, to take up to take up that post to be the so-called collaborator and, and, and working with the WHO uh, country office. So that's when I started to, to, to uh, be involved in international health. And gradually I became involved with the WHO regional officers uh, work. Uh, mm-hmm. as, as you know, there are six regional offices of WHO mm-hmm. all over the world. And then of course I was, I was placed as one of, the st- one of the team member in the health planning division. Health planning division is a very important division, which was also established in the early 60s with mm-hmm. the help from the World Health Organization. Mm-hmm. So the Ministry of Health learned about, you know, how to do proper planning and resource allocation. And I had the chance to, to work on that. So again, you know, as I say, that, that changed my, my career from being a rural doctor to a more policy and planning oriented kind of people. And then, uh, you know, life goes on. 
you you change from one uh, place to the other. And but fortunately enough, you know, most of my career has been about planning, information, research. Yeah. So I, I, I was I was very fortunate to have that, that career path. You know, otherwise, as you may know, uh, in most countries, uh -huh. you have to go with your career to different places, and maybe you don't keep the interest of what what you would like to do. I was lucky enough to have this continuous, you know, uh, years of working in this more or less the same area of public uh, of planning, uh, uh, financing, and and things like that. That's that's why. Uh, as as you introduced me, we started this health economics uh, yeah. uh, group yeah. in in Thailand in the mid eighties, because oh. at that time you know we came across some studies from the American economics economists who pointed out that Thailand is you know now growing very fast in terms of health expenditure, mm -hmm. and our boss said that you know we I don't know I don't understand what that means you know you might have, you may have to read about that and try to understand better what does it mean by health expenditure increase and what does it mean to the country as a whole. So we started this, this kind of thing, so. Interesting, very interesting. Thank you for sharing that with us. And as you know, like um, there are for Afghanistan in public health uh, for physicians who are going to uh, Thailand for doing their masters in public health. And I, um, ah. I, know, I know actually a few of uh, uh, my friends actually got that, um, scholarship and went to Thailand for for doing their oh, masters. I'm glad. Mostly I guess this they're focused on um, health economics as you it's your background too. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, oh interesting. <laughs> no we have a master degree in health economics in, in particular. Yeah, yeah. So that's something mm. that we can um you know even at the at the um you know long term stages like we could, these these conversations will bring people together mostly to find better solutions for you know, the problems uh, of public health across the world. Um, so, th and that's why I started this um, podcast as a health professional. I am working, you know, uh, directly in the front lines. And actually, you know, the, the, the problem across the world is, is um, something that people can learn from each other. And that's how um, yeah. this, this podcast started. Um, and mostly my mm. guests who I invite is also trying to, we are trying to learn from one another. Could you please tell us about when you first started working as a physician in community hospitals in rural Thailand? I, I believe that, you know, we are more or less, you know, following what you could call uh, standard public health uh, strategies. But maybe uh, the, the one big difference is the speed. We started early to be very careful in mm -hmm. uh, screening uh, yeah. travelers who come to Thailand uh, mm -hmm. since uh, late 2019. In other words, you know, we started even before the new year to be alert, on alert of incoming passengers. Mm -hmm. But I have to tell you that uh, that happened partly because uh, Thailand has been going through this kind of so-called uh, alert and, and, and surveillance because of many other uh, so-called potential global pandemics before. Mm -hmm. SARS, you know. Yeah, yeah. So prior uh, experience. Mm -hmm. Ebola, all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I was the deputy minister, we were also, you know, preparing for Ebola in Mers at that time. Mm -hmm. So the, the system has been more or less, you know, uh, putting in place mm -hmm. for that. Uh, but of course, you might also have known that in Thailand, uh, even with that so-called alert, we started to have cases coming in mm -hmm. from abroad first, and then there were some so-called domestic outbreak. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing that we did, of course, is what I would call timely shutdown. <laughs> mm -hmm. But we, we haven't done the so-called the, the serious shutdown. Somebody mm -hmm. call it soft shutdown. Mm -hmm. In mid-March, in mid when, we, when, we we, when we saw two super spreading events in Thailand, after investigation, we, we found that it's, it's super spreading. One is from the from the boxing stadium, which is from a bar mm -hmm. in the in the Ubud area. Uh, people started to be worried, uh, and then of course there was a, a group of uh, medical doctor who did some modeling and went to see the prime minister, convinced him that you know if we don't so called uh, started to uh, stop people from coming in from abroad, you have lots of cases in the hospitals. 
and so finally he decided to 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 do that and he decided to to take over by proclaiming the emergency act so mm-hmm. that there will be so called centralized control by the by the government and he brought in several working groups the society i mean the the civil society in thailand became also more proactive and started to 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 keep advice to provide ideas and the public became more aware of that so the the, the two things one is of course the the, the classic public health the contact tracing in a case investigation testing and things like that and of course the second thing is the timely decision to close down but then of course the third thing is is i i found the thai people uh, compliance or healthy behavior you know wearing masks watching hands things like that uh, quite surprising i mean we 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 comply quite well and we were also fortunate enough that even though in the urban area some poor people have some problems they have crowded uh, living space and things like that they have been trying to look uh, to take good care of themselves so we haven't seen uh, pockets of uh, outbreak in the in the so called uh, underprivileged area mm-hmm. and people started to also be 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 concerned in terms of economic relief package you know i think that the, the government has been doing not too badly but also uh as as in many countries it 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 is it is not enough yeah. and it, you could say that it has helped to stop people from seeking jobs yeah. in other words the, we are not completely closed so a lot of people are, a lot of people are still having uh risk in terms of you know uh caring for other uh, uh taxi drivers public transportation mm-hmm. uh operators and things like that so that that uh, that's another that's the other thing that happened also during that era, that, that that part but we we managed it although not not to the best but uh, not too bad as well so mm-hmm. many of these so called uh, package came in yeah. at, at at the right time i would say mm-hmm. that would be one of the important uh, factor but you might also heard about the community uh, health workers yeah. community volunteers DWs, yeah which has been which has been uh, quite important as well but i have to say that you know it it is not a strategy in 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 the sense that we 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 have thought about thought about it it just came automatically let me explain yeah in thailand as i say you know one of the important uh, intervention or strategy is a classical public health uh, disease surveillance case investigation mm-hmm. and we have had what you could call srrt surveillance and rapid response team and we have a one team in each district in thailand we have about you know 900 districts and we have about 1000 team a district is about a 60000 population mm-hmm. so there is a district hospital as i told you when i started working in the in the early 80s we started that policy right right it, it, it grew and become strong so that become a very important infrastructure an important unit to do disease surveillance along with the health center which is at the at the tambon level one tambon you can think about you know 5000 people and we have a uh, village health volunteer in every district so you have at least one person for 10 households mm-hmm. so there are a million a million volunteers who have been more or less trained to be helping with with health uh, problems and as soon as they know that there were outbreak as soon as they know that it's very serious they 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 started to give uh, information give education and started to organize uh, people but uh, thailand also has other kind of civil society as well so at the community level active citizens have become uh, very helpful as well because of the spread of the information and because of their uh, relationship with the health system at the grassroots level at the at the peripheral level so that has been a very interesting mm-hmm. relationship that exists prior to the to the outbreak so they 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 came in and helped and it was very helpful because in terms of this uh case identification mm-hmm. they are the one who help a lot in early alert because you might you might know that most disease surveillance started at the hospitals mm-hmm. they they start when they are sick patient but at the community level maybe maybe nobody notify yeah. anyone yeah. but when you have people who can help you notify so called high risk of potential cases it become much more early so that that i that i believe has been something that has helped uh, all to put all together to help us uh, contain the the pandemic but now we are opening up 
we are relaxing now and we are we we, we are starting to be worried again you know that uh research the, the the virus is still there of course even though we, you have no cases you can never be sure mm -hmm. it is it, 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 it's gone forever no it, we cannot be, be be that complacent of course yeah we have to be vigilant in terms of like you know reopening yeah. and uh, especially the countries that are in the process of reopening and some countries are uh, more still in the peak of the of the uh, pandemic uh, unfortunately afghanistan is also nowadays um, experiencing the hardest days um, there because of the socioeconomic burden of it too you also pointed to a very important part there the uh, in controlling coronavirus in thailand and people's compliance and um, i think it was from thailand or taiwan i don't remember exactly but um, people were you know especially ladies were um, kind of like uh, being creative and using masks with different colors different different shapes and like, <laughs> different, um, you know yeah, yeah. patterns that that, yeah. that would match their dress or their purse and something yeah, like that exactly, exactly especially at this time of that is a part of the compliance like you know especially at this during this pandemic everything is so depressing and every person like is yeah you know yeah. is really uh having a hard time like oh what is gonna it's 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 really an uncertain like you never know where the virus is and how yeah. people, and its socioeconomic burden is also adding to the problem but people mm -hmm. uh, have to take it you know change these um challenges into opportunities or or take you know the, this yeah turn it around like you know as as people did yeah. the ladies who made the masks and um you yeah. know being creative no no we have all kinds of colorful masks <laughs> but, yeah. but dr hamid let me let me share some of my personal view about these colorful masks sure yeah, yeah. you know i i believe that uh, you know as everybody knew necessity is the mother of invention absolutely uh what happened is that the uh, mask was scarce at the beginning of the pandemic in thailand yes. as yes. well mm. i remember my cousins coming from hong kong in uh, january to thailand mm. to buy masks at that time it was still available mm -hmm. at the normal price yeah, that was the beginning of and, yeah yeah normal yeah. price of masks in thailand it was very cheap it was only one buck Mm. And you know, thirty-five baht is equal to one dollar, so it's it's very cheap for one piece of mask at mm. that time. Yeah. Uh, of course, at the end of January, it started to become more scarce, and the prices went up. Yeah. And of course, you know, uh, people knew that wearing masks is, is helpful, although they they were they were told that you know it is good to prevent you from spreading to others, but it may not prevent you from getting from others. They mm. don't they don't care. So mm. we have to start making our own masks. Mm. And, when, and as you say, when people start to make their own masks, they became inventive. <laughs> so yeah. they don't want to just wear, you know, white or black masks. They yeah. do all kinds of colorful uh, masks Absolutely. and they do all kinds of cloth and things like that. So I mean, Absolutely. Yeah, that, yeah. That, 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 as you say, well, give you a better livelihood. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so, um you're currently the president of the national health foundation of thailand yes yes um could you please tell us a bit about your role uh, there and the role of health foundations in fighting with health crises um like okay. this pandemic okay uh, the national health foundation was a savage about 40 years ago as well mm -hmm. you know quite 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 long ago and as i as i told you it was meant to be promoting knowledge based health system so we try to make sure that in most of the so called health policy decisions they got uh, or they, they they were informed about proper evidences of course we are not the only one who do that actually mm -hmm. i should tell you that gradually over the last 40 years there are more and more mechanisms that have been doing that the health system research institute that i founded in 1992 was one of one of such mechanisms in the formal system. Mm -hmm. Foundation is the so-called informal system, but work closely with the formal mechanisms. So we try to make sure that, you know, we became a good uh, linkage, mm -hmm. became a, a platform for that. Uh, and most of the things that we did are more, uh, uh, you could say more future looking. Mm -hmm. we, we, don't, we don't deal with the immediate management kind of issue. So when, when COVID came, 
we have not been closely involved with the so-called day-to-day decisions. I was personally involved in one of the efforts mm-hmm. to do the so-called integrated modeling to guide policy decision. Because as you say, this pandemic brought in the economic dimension, which is very, very important. So you can't fight the virus without looking at how it impacts the economy. Yes. In other words, you could shut down the country forever so that the disease won't spread. But nobody could live because the economic activity will die down. Yeah. And the economists were, were arguing that, you know, although we know that public health is important. So I, I was trying to, to, to advocate for a, a modeling approach mm-hmm. to guide policy decisions so that we can see both sides of it. Uh, it has, I haven't been that successful, but there were groups that are trying to do that as well. I learned that in, there were groups also in other countries who have been trying to do that. But most of the model are now are still the classic, you know, SEIR model, the the uh, infected uh, recovery kind of things. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so that's one of the one of the thing that the RHS has been trying to do. But the other thing that we have been trying to do as well is to support some so-called rural doctors mm-hmm. who are who are so-called fighting the the, the, the diseases. Yeah. And one of the activities that we have been involved with is to uh, set up isolation units. As you know, you know, there are three things, right? Yes. Contact tracing, mm-hmm. testing, and isolation, what you call TTI. Mm-hmm. The TTI has to be a package. Isolation is important because if you don't have effective isolation, maybe if you have home isolation, a potential high-risk case could be a spreader at home mm-hmm. or in, in the community. Yeah. Someone who wants to stay home could be denied by their community, by their, you know, yeah. by their neighbors. And they may need a place to stay and still get isolated. Mm-hmm. So in Thailand, we try to use hotels. So one of my colleagues has been organizing volunteers mm-hmm. to help train people who are taking care of these so-called isolated high-risk individuals mm-hmm. in the hotels. In, in, the, in the areas where there are, you know, higher uh, prevalence of infected infection because in Thailand, it doesn't spread equally. The southern part of Thailand has been quite, quite, uh, quite common because of the Malaysian uh, border as well. But anyway, so that's another thing that, that we did. But the other thing that we are, still, we are trying to do, and it might be a, a bit more longer term, is to rethink how the health system should be like. Mm-hmm. Because as we all know, with the COVID, we stopped seeing other kind of patients. The non-COVID patients are left behind. And now, you know, you have to find a way. You can say, that, okay, okay, it will be temporarily. Now we are going, going back to the way that it used to be before COVID. Yeah. Yeah. But if the COVID pandemic continues, and ho- big hospital has to be on alert, they will, ha- they will have to reduce the number of patients that they saw. Mm-hmm. But we should not leave them, you know, unattended. Yeah. So one of the one of the things that we are trying to do is to uh, talk to the so-called system redesign people to make sure that we collectively look at how the so-called primary care, secondary care, tertiary care could work together, mm-hmm. including using the telemedicine the, in the yeah. IT mm-hmm. uh, technology, new technology, to yeah. make sure that we have new ways of providing services that would reassure the people, give them uh, good enough care without. Ha- them having to travel, we might end up with a, with a better model of care. So that's another thing that the National Health Foundation is, is uh, trying to, 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 to organize and, 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 to, and to do it. And of course, it coincides with some of the other things that we have been working on before that, which is the information system, uh, the, the so-called patient health record, where mm-hmm. patients would have their own record, and then they will be able to use their own health record. Mm-hmm. And then they will be the one who you know, could be could have a new relationship with service providers. So these are kind of the kind of things that the National Foundation has been has been uh, involved with. Some are directly related to COVID. Many are not because, as I say, you know, we have been trying to look at how the health system should evolve in the long run. Mm-hmm. So that that that's more or less uh, what we have been trying to do. And and as, as I told you, during the COVID, we have opportunity to work on different aspects of the COVID. Uh, the, pandemic prevention or, or, mm-hmm. or relief or 
you know, uh, improvement of the health service delivery. Correct. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and we are almost to the end of this podcast. And uh, what would be your advice for other nations, especially countries with low research, such as Afghanistan, that are struggling with bringing coronavirus under control? I would say that maybe, you know, from the Thai experiences, there are many things that the developing countries could, could learn. One, one thing that I think I, I would like to, to share is that uh, we started build up our public health systems 80 years ago. And we started uh, very small. Mm -hmm. We started with health centers at the most peripheral level. And then gradually moved into hospitals at the so-called provincial level. Mm -hmm. One of the things is that we try not to focus in big cities. So I believe that if you build a system infrastructure uh, like that, gradually, gradually, mm -hmm. it, will, it will give you a strong health system at the end. Of course, if you need to do it uh, quickly, you can also do it, but make sure that it is well supported. So the second point is that you don't just have the peripheral health unit with very low mm -hmm. capacity. Mm -hmm. You have to have a unit which you know, oversees and support them. In Thailand, it is a district, district hospital. So the district health system is, is always the key. And as I told you, in Thailand, the district health system became strong about uh, 40, 40 years ago. You know, mm -hmm. So it's about midway that we started our, our, our health system. Yeah. Then, the, then the third thing that I think you, you mentioned already is a strong community participation. The real participation in the sense that they, uh, they, are, they are informed, they became active. They yeah. became active citizens. They are not just passive uh, helpers of the health workers. Mm -hmm. They are enthusiastic. They are convinced because they are respected. You know, mm -hmm. you give them important. You see them as important players. You don't see them as your, your, your assistants, your servants, or you know, someone who just wait for your orders. Mm -hmm. I think that kind of thing. We started that about the 30 years ago mm -hmm. with the primary health care policy. So one of the, one of the important things is to, is to make sure that you have a balance. Mm. Most countries would certainly like to put more money into big hospitals in big cities. Mm -hmm. But as I told you, you know, at least in the Thai health system, the municipal public health has been mainly concerned yeah. with hospitals and health service system outside of Bangkok. The other thing that I like to add is, is this uh, disease prevention thing. Mm -hmm. As you know, there are many so-called public health functions which are important. One of them is disease control. Right. And we have started the so-called field epidemiology training program, mm -hmm. FETP, collaborating with the USCDC. Again, you know, 35 years ago, mm -hmm. since the, since the, 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 the mid-80s. Mm -hmm. And we have, you know, continued doing that. Although we produce only five individuals a year, you know, over the last 35 years, we have had good enough a number of people who understand mm -hmm. and the, 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 the knowledge, it's just like health economics. It's also spread, people became aware, aware and they built up the, the network, the infrastructure, even though we have only not that many uh, so-called field virologists, we have 1,000 SRT teams all over the country because we train other people as well. Mm -hmm. So building up uh, this is surveillance, disease control, epidemiology uh, kind of people is also very important. That has helped us a lot, you know, during the past uh, uh, few decades in terms of, you know, mm -hmm. surveillance, uh, collaborating with other countries, building up disease surveillance in, 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 in the country. So those are the, those are the, the, the two things. And of course, in between, you need good health personnel. Uh, we have had, as I told you, a compulsory services of medical doctors, yeah. but we have also a uh, nurse. Uh, one thing that I, I don't know, but nurse, nursing would be another important part to, to stress. You know, we have been able to solve the issue of nurses shortage in the mm -hmm. rural area of Thailand mm -hmm. because the Ministry of Health became the producer of nurses. In other words, we produce nurses by recruiting them from, from the provinces that they were, they, were, they were living, they grew up. Mm -hmm. And then we give them a scholarship and ask them to go back and serve their at least, you know, uh, 
twice the number of years that they 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 spend in the nursing schools. Mm. So that that are, those are some. Of, but of course, the most important thing, as I always say, is that you should keep on you know improving the health system. Mm -hmm. You don't leave them unfunded or underfunded. Otherwise, you know, without infrastructure, without the manpower, you can't keep them there. Right. But that 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 would be more or less what I what I what I hope. You know, uh, many of the so-called developing countries could started to do that. And I have been trying, uh, working at the global level, to to talk to many of the so-called global donors. You might have heard about the argument about vertical program, yeah, and system yeah. strengthening. They always want to spend money for for vertical program, mm -hmm. and they don't care about the infrastructure. They don't care about the people who work there. They all, only want their program to be successful. Mm -hmm. But that's not the way to to help a country. So I I hope that you know this will be something that. We should be fighting for, and for a developing country, I think dealing with global donors, you have to be strong. You have to be in control rather than you know allow them to dictate your what what you are supposed to do because they have the money to give you. Well, thank you so much. Um, we'll definitely learn from your experiences, and thank you so much. It was an honor and privilege to have you on the show today. And uh, okay. dear audience, uh, thank you very much for being with us today, um, and stay tuned with more podcasts with Dr. E.